1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will depart or fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. That's as far as we have gotten in the last three messages. We'll pick up in the middle of verse 7 and go through verse 11 today. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, today as we seek your word, in your word. As we seek you, for you to speak to us in the pages of your Bible, we pray that we might be open to what you want to tell us today about our activities as soldiers of the Lord. And we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Back in 2005, a soldier who was stationed at Hunter Army Airfield in my hometown of Savannah, Georgia, was tried and convicted for failure to deploy with his unit to Iraq. Despite the fact that he had joined the Army of his own free will, despite the fact that he had served apparently without incident for a number of years, despite the fact that he had already served one overseas assignment this time around, he decided that he simply did not want to go. And so he declared himself to be a conscientious objector and claimed his belief that war, no war, was ever justified. And so while hundreds of others took their places and went forward as they had sworn to do to defend liberty and to fight against the cause of terrorism, this man stayed home leaving his fellow soldiers short-handed on the battlefield. As I watched that scenario play out in the media back in 2005, I thought to myself, how much unfortunately like the army of the Lord. As Christians, we are soldiers in the Lord's army, foot soldiers in the ongoing cosmic conflict between the forces of darkness and the kingdom of light having been sent out by our commander-in-chief to do battle with all of Satan's forces, both seen and unseen. But while the number of deserters in the United States Army is minimal, it would seem that a great percentage of the Army of the Lord won't wear the uniform, but have no intention whatsoever of picking up their weapons and living up to their duties as soldiers of the Lord. In the previous three messages we've seen in 1 Timothy 4, we've been looking at the subject of Christian soldiers and the warfare we face. We've seen the, so far the soldiers' atmosphere, the soldiers' adversaries, the soldiers' armor, the soldiers' allies, the soldiers' attitude, and the soldiers' appetite. We want to pick up there as we continue to explore this theme of onward Christian soldiers. So notice first this morning and seventh overall, the soldiers' activities. Many of us, no doubt, can remember singing as children the old children's song, I'm in the Lord's Army. 
I began this series with that song, as a matter of fact. That song says, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never soar over the enemy, but I am in the Lord's army. Well, that song's good as far as it goes, but here's my problem with it. It tells us all the things we don't do as soldiers in the Lord's army, but it doesn't tell us what we do as soldiers in the Lord's army. Well, think for just a second in your mind, what do soldiers do? Well, you might say, well, soldiers have a variety of functions. They have a variety of assignments. They have a variety of duty stations. They have a variety of tasks. Well, all of that is true, but if you boil it down to its absolute essence, basically soldiers do two things. They train to wage war, and then they go out and wage war. That's what soldiers do. And the Apostle Paul tells Timothy here in these verses, that is exactly what we as Christian soldiers are called to do. He emphasizes first the importance of self-discipline for godliness. Look at the latter part of verse 7. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That word discipline in verse 7 is the Greek word gymnazo. It's the same word we get. It, it, the, it's the word we get our English words gymnastics from or gymnasium. Every first century Greek city had a public gymnasium. Because physical fitness was seen as a high value in that culture much as it is in ours. As a matter of fact, Ephesus, where Timothy was serving when Paul wrote him this letter, required all young men between the ages of 16 and 18 to enter into a rigorous program of physical training so that they would be strong and healthy as citizens as they took their place as adults. The point is this. Nobody just stumbles into physical fitness. It requires self-discipline because for most of us, our natural inclination is not to exercise. And therefore, if a person's going to be fit, he must put forth the conscious effort to get off the couch, to set down the remote, and to get moving in some kind of regular workout routine. Paul is saying here that the same thing is true in the spiritual realm. Nobody just stumbles into godliness, which is the spiritual equivalent of physical fitness. The natural inclination of the flesh, the old sin nature, is towards sin and away from godliness. And the only way to overcome that and turn that around is it, to, it requires the regular spiritual exercise of spiritual discipline. Things like personal and corporate worship, personal Bible study, hearing the Word taught and proclaimed, service and prayer. The illustration I've used many times before is that the pursuit of godliness is like walking up a down escalator. It is possible to walk up a down escalator. It can be done. But in order to walk up a down escalator, you've got to put forth more upward effort than the downward momentum of the escalator. And listen, if you ever stop in that process before you reach the top, you don't stay at the level you've attained. You go backwards. And you may find yourself right back at the bottom again. Likewise, if we're going to be godly, it requires constant conscious effort on our part to overcome our natural bent towards sin and fill our lives with the things of God. And if we ever get lax in our spiritual disciplines, we won't stay at whatever le level we've attained spiritually. No, we'll backslide into fleshly thinking, carnal attitudes, and a worldly lifestyle. No one will ever drift toward godliness. Because the, the tide of the world, the flesh, and the devil is all away from God and away from godliness and away from righteousness and towards sinfulness. It takes effort to row against the tide. To go with the tide requires nothing. Any dead fish can go with the tide. But to row against the tide, that requires effort. A famous violinist was once being interviewed about his practice habits, which at that time amounted to several hours a day. 
And the interviewer kind of insinuated, well, you're a, you're a world famous violinist. You're acclaimed as one of the best violinists in the world. Surely you don't need to practice as much as you used to. And the violinist replied, on the contrary. He said, if I miss a day of practice, I know it. If I miss a week of practice, the conductor knows it. If I miss a month of practice, everybody knows it. And I found that same dynamic to be true in my own spiritual life. If I miss a few days of spending time with the Lord, I know it. I can tell the difference in my outlook. I can tell the difference in my attitude. I can tell the difference in my thinking. I can tell the difference in how I handle stress. If I miss a few more days, maybe a week of spending time with the Lord, Heidi knows it. Because my normal, sweet, lovable self That's right. starts becoming aggravated and irritable and impatient at home. And if I were to miss several weeks of spending time with the Lord, I suspect most everybody around me would know it. Because we all try to put our best face forward, don't we? But if that best face forward is just a mask that doesn't reflect what's underneath the surface, eventually what's really there will come out. Back in 1999, I was working out a lot, physically speaking. I was working out six days a week, at least an hour a day. I was lifting weights. I was doing cardio. I'd lost a bunch of weight. I'd gained a bunch of muscle. I was literally in the best shape of my life. And then in April of that year, I blew a disc in my back. And it required surgery. And I was out of commission for surgery. And then I got a staph infection on top of that. And I was out of commission for a longer time. And then I got another infection caused by the antibiotics from the staph infection. I was, I was out of commission from April of that year to July. And I remember the day the doctor released me. He... He said, well, you're doing, you're doing well, your, your back's healing, and I'm going to just release you to do whatever you feel like doing at this point. The first question I asked him, it's hard to believe this, but the first question I asked him is, can I go back to the gym and lift weights? He said, yes, but here's the deal. I don't want you to use free weights. I want you to use machine weights. And he said, I want you to start with half of what you were lifting before. Well, that same day, I swaggered back into the gym, go, half of what I used to live. I sat down at the first machine, I keyed up half of what I used to lift, and I went, I couldn't lift half of what I used to lift. As a matter of fact, I could only barely lift about 25% of what I used to lift. That three months of inactivity had erased over a year of gains. See, even if you were to take an elite athlete and incapacitate him with a serious injury such that he couldn't train anymore, that lean, toned, muscular body would lose its muscle tone and it would become increasingly flabby. By the same token, even the most spiritual of Christians who neglect spiritual disciplines will become increasingly fleshly, less and less led by the Spirit, more and more dominated by the old sin nature. And we know that in our physical lives, being in shape physically has wide-ranging health benefits, and being out of shape physically has wide-ranging negative repercussions for our health. But as important as physical fitness is, Paul says, nothing compares to the importance of spiritual fitness. Physical fitness, he says, may affect our lives for the few years we live on earth. Physical fitness may give us a longer lifespan. Physical fitness may give us a healthier lifespan and a more enjoyable lifespan. But it only counts for this life. He says spirituality, on the other hand, godliness has repercussions that begin now and reach into eternity, both in our lives in terms of abundant life and eternal rewards and in other people's lives as our godliness influences them toward Christ. And that brings us to a second task, a second activity of the Christian soldier, the spreading of the gospel. Verse 10 says, for it is for this we labor and strive, 
because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers, prescribe and teach these things. For what cause do soldiers labor and strive in training? So they can go out and win a war. For what cause do we as Christians labor and strive for godliness so that we can go out and win the lost? See, we who have fixed our hope on the living God for salvation have been given the assignment of introducing others to that only hope of eternal life. The message of the gospel that says, though all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Apart from Christ, we're all lost in our sins, separated from fellowship with God and condemned to hell. But when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior by turning from our sins and repentance, placing our faith in Him and surrendering our lives to His Lordship, we're forgiven for our sins. We're adopted into His family. And we're given the promise of eternal life in heaven. That's the message we're to be giving out to a lost and dying world, the message of hope through Christ. And that's why we are to live lives of godliness. Lest our message be sullied and hampered by an inconsistent lifestyle. I remember back when the first Gulf War broke out, back in the early 90s. And they started activating some... National Guard units and some Army Reserve units. Some of those units hadn't been activated since the Vietnam War. And some of the soldiers in those units balked. I remember very clearly seeing the news and seeing a young man standing there in front of the camera with the microphone in his face. And here's, the, here's his exact words. He says, I joined the National Guard to go to college, not to go to war. I mean, Christians are like that. See, he wanted to put in his training. He wanted to do his one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. He wanted to wear the uniform. He wanted to learn how to be a soldier, but he didn't want to actually have to go out and put that training into practice. And the same is true of many Christians who are absolutely committed to self-disciplining themselves for godliness, but very little, if any, committed to spreading the gospel. What does Paul mean in the latter part of verse 10 when he says that God is the Savior of all men, but especially of those who believe just this, Christ's death on the cross was for all people of every race, every tribe, every nation, every language, every color, every time period, and every culture. When he died as our sacrifice and our substitute, he bore in himself the sin of every person who has ever lived and every person who ever will live, and his sacrifice is sufficient to save every person from every sin they've ever committed. But it is only those who hear that message and who respond to that message in faith, who personally turn from their sins and place their faith in Him as their Lord and Savior. It's only those people who will experience His salvation. As Paul says in Romans 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he goes on to ask this, how can they call upon somebody that they haven't believed in? And how can they believe in someone that they've never heard of? And how can they hear unless we who know him tell them? Like Timothy in verse 11 we're called to prescribe and teach these things to one another and to the lost who need to hear the good news of Christ. I like the way the New American Standard uses that word prescribe in verse 11. We've all had doctors give us prescriptions for whatever it is that ails us. Well, today the great physician has a prescription for each one of us. To the Christians in the congregation, his prescription is that we discipline ourselves for godliness and involve ourselves in the spreading of the gospel. 
for those who don't know Jesus today. His prescription is to receive what he did for you on the cross when he died for you. To call in repentance and faith on the living God, the one who rose from the dead and lives forever, to save those who will call on him. In verse 11, Paul says that we as Christians have fixed our hope on the living God. That verb tense there speaks of an action that takes place at a point in time, at a moment, but whose repercussions continue on forever. So let me ask you today, have you had that life-changing, eternity-changing moment in your life? That life-changing, eternity-changing moment when you received Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you fixed your hope on the living God, when you put your faith in what he did on the cross of Calvary, when he bled and died to pay the price for your sins, have you had that eternity changing moment. You can have that moment in this moment. This could be your defining moment. This could be your defining moment of turning from your sins and placing your faith in Him, surrendering your life to His Lordship. I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, bow your heads, close your eyes. Nobody looking around, nobody moving around. If you've never had that defining moment, that eternity-changing moment of decision, now's your time. Say, how do you know it's my time? Because the Bible says so. The Bible says now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. God's invitations are always addressed to the present, to the now. He never says, think about it, put it off. Do it later. He always says, now is the time. This is your moment. He has brought you to this point and to this place to make this decision. A decision that will change your eternal, uh, eternal destiny from hell to heaven. A decision that will change your life from self-directed to God-directed. That's the defining moment we're talking about. As we said earlier, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want Jesus to save you today, you need to ask him to save you. And I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. There's nothing magic about the prayer. If it does not reflect the desire of your heart, it's just empty words. But if the desire of your heart today is to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to pray something along these lines. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done things that have displeased you. But right now I turn from my sins and repentance. I place my faith in you and what you did on the cross. Come into my life. Change me. Make me the kind of person that you want me to be. And I'll do my very best to live for you every day of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. Everybody look up at me for just a moment. If you just prayed that prayer, and ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, the first thing he asks of you is that you confess him publicly before men and then that you follow him in New Testament baptism. We're going to give you the opportunity today to confess Jesus before this assembled congregation. The way we do that is in just a moment we're going to sing an invitation hymn. So we sing that invitation hymn, I'll come down front here to meet you. You need to step out wherever you are. If somebody's in front of you, they'll get out of your way. You need to walk one of these aisles and just come forward and say, Brother Donnie, I've asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And I'll present you to the congregation. We'll celebrate your decision and we'll set up a time when you can be baptized. It may be here that you're here today and you're a child of God, you're a soldier in the Lord's army, but you're like those deserters. You're not fulfilling your, your sworn duty as a Christian soldier. And the Lord's put his finger on something in your life that's not as it should be. And you may want to come to this altar and get that right with the Lord. Make a recommitment of yourself to him. You may want to come and have me pray with you. Maybe today that you're here and you're a child of God and you're like a Lone Ranger soldier out there on your own. Soldiers don't last long on their own. They only do well when they're in the company of other soldiers and you need a local church home where you can be a part of something bigger than yourself, where you can grow in godliness and where you can put your gifts and talents and abilities in place to help with the spread of the gospel. The Lord is leading you to unite with Calvary today. You need to come as well. I'll be down front to meet you. You come today.
we stand and sing, I need thee every hour. Won't you come?